Hello, Devoted Dreamers. So I am stepping in today to do a little bit of a bonus mini episode. I don't know how many it's going to be, but um, I've had a request to share a little bit of my testimony, we'll say, and I wanted to take this opportunity here in the very last week of May of 2019. There are five Wednesdays in May, and I don't usually have anything planned for the fifth Wednesday um, since all my episodes go live on Wednesdays. And so when I got this request to share some of my testimony, I decided I would just grab myself a cup of coffee, sit down, and um, process through with you a little bit about where I've come from, where God has brought me, and um, a little bit of what kind of fuels my fire for women. And so this episode is not attached to any season. You won't see a episode number, but I know you guys don't care about all that stuff. <laughs> so um, let's just jump into it. So In case you're new to me, my name is Merit Ansa. I have been hosting this podcast for nearly three years. In fact, June 1st is my anniversary. And I would have told you probably 15 years ago that sharing about my past in a public way was the last thing I would do. And certainly 20 years ago, I never would have believed that I would sit in front of a microphone and interview people and talk about my life at all, share anything that publicly. But God has done uh, incredible miracles in my midst, and he has saved me from a life of destruction and, you know, death and um, so much. So let me jump into that. Uh, My early years, so this is kind of childhood, elementary school. um, I really uh, was a good girl. That was just, I I have this uh, memory of believing that I was like my parents' little angel. I don't know if they actually use those words, but that was kind of how I understood who I was supposed to be in my family. And so as I got older, I certainly figured out that I was not perfect or flawless. And so I spent a lot of my time kind of pretending that I was good or hiding um, the things about me that were not good um, because I really desperately wanted approval and I wanted people to like me. I was so hungry for attention and love and affection and A lot of that's really normal, Um, but what I did receive, and my parents were very loving and very caring, but it just was never enough, and I put a lot of pressure on myself, um, and just as as the years went on into middle school and all the things that go along with that, um, whenever I got in trouble, I would lie about it or I would try not to get caught. And there was some sense of, I guess, morality. Like we attended church for a while. Um, I did pray and I read the Bible as a child. I'm not sure I really knew what I was reading, but I think I had a sense of there was something bigger than me out there. But I knew nothing of salvation or a personal relationship with Christ. I really didn't know who Jesus was to me. I prayed to God. I didn't understand this man, Jesus, or why it was necessary for him to come to earth as a baby and um, be, you know, beaten and tortured and killed on the cross. I didn't understand any of that. And I always thought it was really strange when childhood friends of mine would ask, are you a Christian? I was kind of like, my, I don't, I don't know. Is there a chance that I'm not? Like, I thought everybody was a Christian because I don't know. That's just the world that I grew up in. So, kind of moving on into my teen years, um, I will say that boys started paying attention to me when I was very young. When I was young, I looked much older. Now that I'm older, I look much younger. I guess that's a nice trade-off. Um, but the boys that were interested in me were always much older. And starting in middle school, I felt pressured to be physical in relationships with boys. And it really, it seemed wrong, but I did not know how to speak up. 
um, because I feared rejection from them. You know, remember, I desperately longed for attention, love and affection. And the last thing I wanted was to be rejected by somebody that was interested in me. And it's funny now looking back, I'm not even sure I knew which boys I was interested in because I always kind of um, tended to lean into the ones that were interested in me. Not all of them, but it was like, oh, well, there might be a guarantee for love, maybe, <laughs> as if there's a guarantee. But I was fascinated with love and romance and relationships. And I just, I wanted a boyfriend desperately. And um, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, got physically involved with boys at a very young age. And um, there was an incident, I will say, I got caught by my parents with a boyfriend. And um, it was a very compromising situation. And this incident, um, I was 14 years old, it turned into the deepest shame that I've ever felt in my life. We never talked about it in our home. Um, I, wa I literally woke up the next morning and I wanted to die. Like I wanted to, or at least like be invisible. I did not want to be seen or known or talked to about what had happened. And that I think was the beginning of close to 20 years of really unhealthy relationships with boys and men. That and the physical stuff. I had a friend tell me many years later that when you start getting intimately involved at a really young age, you kind of mentally and emotionally stop growing because I don't know, there, there's just this like halting within you. And so um, I really feel that now. Um, I have recovered from a lot of that, but I know that I, you know, at 14 years old, getting involved in sexual things with boys um, was about the, the most damaging thing I could have done for my mental and emotional health. So this became, um, at the time, I mean, I was not mature enough to be in these kinds of relationships. And so my perspective of being in a relationship with somebody was all about getting something from them. It was like an exchange or a transaction. And whether that was finding my identity in them or feeling some sort of value and worth from being loved, that that's what I got forgiving of myself. Of course, that was never enough. Um, and it always left me empty. And there were breakups after breakups after breakups. Um, and in this season of my life, I was pretty cynical. So teen years through college in my 20s, um, I was really cynical about anything related to religion. And I was especially rebellious towards Christ. So I would have been one of those people that if someone talked about like Jesus being their savior, I totally would have mocked them. <laughs> um, and you know, I did talk to God in the deepest, darkest moments, in moments of desperation or depression, but I was really very unsure if anyone heard those prayers. I would journal to him, um, but never had a sense that there was like a response or a receiver of that information. <laughs> So now moving on to college, I moved five hours away from home and was really kind of hoping to start over. I had gained not the greatest reputation in high school. And, um, you know, this felt like um, turning over a new leaf. Like I, I would be different this time. This would, this was going to be different, <laughs> but sadly, no, uh, there were a lot of the same patterns. And now I had access to alcohol and parties more so than I did in high school. I mean, that was still there. I probably started drinking when I was 16 or 17. Um, but the access wasn't there. So, um, now that I was in college and had a lot of friends that were over 21, um, I could pretty much get drunk every weekend if that's what I wanted. And at the time, it was what I wanted because I was really hurting inside. I was very lonely, um, still had this incredible in obsession with relationships and love and being loved and romance and just knew that there was going to be some college boy who would sweep me off my feet. And it really didn't happen that way. Um 
it, there was a lot more of that transactional relationship where I gave something huge of myself, it, you know, hoping to get something in return, huge, like love and romance and a relationship. And, you know, those relationships lasted, you know, sometimes a few days and sometimes weeks or months or maybe even a year. Um, but they always ended kind of in the same way with me, you know, in a ball on the floor, um, in a puddle of tears, and not understanding why yet again another relationship was broken. And so I would convince myself that maybe I'd just chosen the wrong guy, and I would vow that next time it would be different. <laughs> and it never was. Um, and when I didn't have a boyfriend, I was always searching. And this got especially um worse kind of into my 20s and 30s as friends of mine started getting married and I had like zero prospects. Um, and so I use the term now that I was shopping for a boyfriend and eventually for a husband. And in my lowest of lows, it didn't really even matter if the guy I met at the party turned into anything long term. I just wanted to be chosen. Like, do you can you relate to that feeling of like, I just wanted somebody to say, yes, you, I pick you of all these women here. I pick you. Um, and I honestly, I had no idea what love was. I had no idea what it was to love someone, to give of myself, like in a sacrificial way instead of a transactional way, or to be loved. I had no clue about that. So into my 20s, this cycle with men went on and on. And I went to grad school. Um had a boyfriend at that time who was serious and had some good potential, but ultimately could never make the choice to move forward in marriage. And so we broke up and I moved out of state for my first real job. And again, was like, okay, here's a new chance to start over. And I dated a lot of different guys. I had access to a lot of guys, um, kind of all in our 20s. We were all trying to find our way in a new place. And um, and I was, I did kind of arrive there brokenhearted about the breakup with the guy who could never propose. And eventually, um, you know, that just, that made, that put me in a situation to kind of relationship hop. So I tried to pick the guys who would stick around. Um, and that, you know, none of that was ever <laughs> fruitful, we'll say, um, at least in my mind. Um, I know God was using that season for sure. Um, but I eventually met a guy. Um, this would have been in my late 20s. So I was probably 27, 28. Um, and I thought he was the one. And again, I told myself, like, I'm going to do this differently. Um, I'm not going to sleep with him on the first date. And um, it turns out he was he was kind of as messy as I was. He had a lot of the same baggage that I had and, um, you know, had, had a recent breakup, you know, right as we were starting to date. And that was really uh, tumultuous, I will say, um, there at the beginning of something new between us. And then eventually, like we dated for a year and then for a year that we lived together and that's where you really get to know someone, right? And we fought like cats and dogs. We were totally out of control. And I remember like running down the hall to our guest room and slamming the door and locking myself in the room because I was like fearful. I don't know that I ever thought that he would hurt me, but everything in us was totally out of control. And I ultimately cheated on him, um, kind of probably in my own way to try to escape the relationship. But really, I felt like, oh, this guy that I was with, um, you know, he couldn't love me. But, oh, there was this other guy and he understands me. And so, you know, that's how you so easily fall into infidelity. And um, it was a, you know, ba basically a, qu a kiss and an emotional um, tie to this other guy. Um, and I lied. I, you know, came home from this event where I met this other guy and I pretended like nothing had happened. But inside, I was a total mess and trying to figure out how to get out of this relationship. And so eventually we broke up, um, but I was certainly not prepared for what happened next. So I was um, 29 and um, he and I 
you know, we were living together. So uh, we both accepted jobs to move out of state, um, actually with the same small company. (laughs) Um, And we kind of decided together, like, well, this, I guess, is at least um, maybe not over, but at least we need a break for now. Like we're kind of a disaster. And so we moved to separate apartments, but moved for jobs with the same company. I mean, we drove a U-Haul together (laughs) um, and then unpacked his half and unpacked my half and then went to work at this new company. And everyone we worked with was a Christian. They knew Jesus. And, you know, again, I didn't really know what that meant, but I was like, it's fine with me. Just don't push your religion on me. Like, don't talk to me about it. Don't push it on me. And they were like, okay. Um, and within three months, we probably moved there in July. And by September, the tumultuousness of me and my ex kind of still being in each other's lives, but not being in each other's lives. Um, and him finding out that I had cheated on him and just kind of all the disaster of that. Um, he overnight accepted Christ. And I've not seen this often. (laughs) Um, But he was different immediately. It was like the spirit changed him from an insecure, freaked out, possessive, angry um, man into a forgiving man. He, in the moment of, you know, we needed to have this conversation about this other guy that I had been involved with, he forgave me without me even asking for that. And so I was a little bit taken aback by what had happened to him. And I kind of was like, oh, we'll see. Because this guy had been, you know, he wasn't stalking me. But he was acting very strange as I drifted from him um, in our new city. And that stopped. I mean, it literally stopped overnight. I had never experienced this happening. I had never experienced someone changing this dramatically overnight. And it began to occur to me that maybe there was something to this Holy Spirit saving faith in Jesus. I, I don't know. And you know, I was alone in a new city, a big city. I don't think I'd ever lived in a city this big. Um, but I knew only my coworkers and my ex-boyfriend. As I mentioned, our breakup was bad. <laughs> um, but he was really my only friend. And so as the days and months passed um, since he became a Christian, Uh, At the same time, our company was failing. This was in the middle of all the dot-com stuff in the early 2000s. And we would sit at work while our team members were out trying to find new venture capital or, um, you know, figure out another runway for us. Um, We didn't have a lot of work to do. And so he would bring his Bible to work and he would tell me about God and about Jesus. And he told me the story of Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul, the man who was killing Christians that was saved by Jesus. I had never heard of this man. I had no idea who he was. Um, He also shared the bridge illustration with me where, you know, there was this, I'm very visual, so kind of this identifying that there's a separation between you and God because of your sin. Well, sin was a word that I'd never used in my life, like wasn't permitted to be used in my home. And so I didn't realize that I, like that all the things, all the burden of my life was because of sin um, and that there needed to be a price paid for my sin, for me to be able to be one close with God again. Um, so this guy, you know, we dated a while and he knew all my objections. He knew all the places that I was going to say, yeah, but what about this? And he could point me to places in scripture that answered those. And I mean, think about it. This guy was a new believer. And so this had to be a miracle of God that he could even know in scripture where to point somebody else that had questions about the faith. So one February morning, this was probably, this was 2001, um, I had left work the previous Friday, and one of the guys that we worked with who I believed was probably one of the smartest people I'd ever met, 
and yet he still loved Jesus. And that was a quandary for me. I didn't understand that at all. Um, but he had said to me, um, hey, have you ever been to the website for this church that he attends? And I said, no. Um, and, you know, this is when websites were fairly new. Um, and I had gone to the church a couple times. And our friend said, you should check it out. It's a really cool website. And, you know, if you see the button that says free gift, go check, go click on that. And I was like, cool, T-shirt, CD, whatever, <laughs> you know. But little did I know when I went to the website and clicked on the button for a free gift, I found a presentation of the gospel presented in the most clear way I'd ever heard it. And I walked through every page of it saying, yes, 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 this is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I know about myself. And at the end of that presentation, I realized that the only thing left was to say yes to Jesus and become a Christian myself. And I was still like, are you sure, God? Like, I don't even, I don't even know how much of this I believe, but I knew that I had tried everything else, literally everything else to find my identity, my hope, my value, my worth. And I tried everything but Jesus. So I did it. I clicked on it. I said, yes, I have come to faith today. And then the very next page of that presentation said, okay, now go tell somebody. And I had had a friend um, in the previous state where I'd lived, and I knew that she was a Christian. We would go to lunch, and she would always pray. Um, she talked about her faith a little bit, but not a ton. But I knew enough that she was the person that needed to know that I had just received Jesus as my Savior. And when I called her, she, like, bounced off the ceiling. She was so excited. I'm sure she, like, screamed so loud the neighbors heard her. But she ended up sending me a package with – like like a Christian music CD to listen to and a journal and a book. And I'm pretty sure it was around that time that my ex had given me a study Bible. And it was this weird season of like, I don't even know what to do with this. Like I'm, I'm grateful, but I don't even know what comes next. And I was totally out of my comfort zone. And I just kind of floundered in that place of like, I would listen to that CD and I would journal a little bit and I'd talk to God and I'd kind of open my Bible, but I never really knew where to start. Um, so after about a year, I signed up for a Bible study with some other brand new baby believers. And this was, I will say now it was life-changing. At the time, it was the most weird and awkward thing I'd ever done. I'd never been to a Bible study. <laughs> um, I never opened my Bible and read it and examined scripture with other people, but that's what we began to do. And I learned how to memorize scripture. And it turns out that I had been in two organizations as a young person where I was already memorizing scripture and just didn't know. I mean, maybe I knew it was from the Bible, but I didn't know like, this is God's word. This is him speaking directly to me. And so I began to see little glimpses of how the Lord had been working in my life and drawing me to himself in the midst of my mess and disaster, even when I had no clue that that's what is, was happening. So in that sweet Bible study, I learned how to pray, study the Bible. I learned how to share my testimony and talk about things that like I didn't even really understand were happening to me um, as far as coming to faith in Christ. And yet I was still really, really hurting from the wounds of my past, um, all those broken relationships, shame, insecurity, all those things were like still deeply ingrained in me. And even though my identity was now in Christ, I really wasn't living it out. I was still so captive to my old life and my old ways. So another year later, now two years into being a Christian, I had a friend in that first Bible study who was a recovering alcoholic, and she knew um, that my heart was just wrecked. She knew how hurt I was inside. And our church had a Celebrate Recovery program, which is a 12-step program that uses the Bible and scripture and principles from God's word to walk you through the 12 steps of recovery. And she had obviously done AA um, and knew all about it, knew the benefits and just kind of gently suggested to me, like, 
maybe you should think about this. And I mean, she didn't know that I had been thinking about it for probably four months, <laughs> um, but I had no idea. I didn't understand what recovery was. I didn't understand what I needed to recover from. But one thing I did know was that I cried all the time. This was a season in my life, like I think I decided to stop wearing mascara because I was always crying. You know, I would be in worship and tears would just be streaming down my face. Like there was just no point <laughs> in wearing mascara ever. Um, but I did decide to show up to celebrate recovery. I even said, like, I don't really know why I'm here. Like whatever question they asked on the first night, I was like shell shocked and embarrassed. And I, I couldn't even figure out like how to answer those questions, but I kept going. People told me to keep coming and I knew that I was experiencing Christ there and that there, and I was watching people tell stories of their freedom in their life that Jesus had given them. And so I kept going. And after several, several months um, in step four, you do something called a fearless moral inventory where you write down um, all the times in your life where you have hurt someone or been hurt by someone. And this is a very extensive process. It took me months to go through this, but it was when I finally began to face what my life had looked like before I knew Jesus. You know, my um, defense mechanism was to hide and to run and pretend that the bad things never happened. And Jesus began to say, you are keeping all of that in the dark. And in the darkness, it can fester and it can um, destroy you or it can attempt to. The enemy can attempt to destroy you with your past and the truths that you know about yourself, but that you have never exposed to the light. And so very, very gently and slowly, um, I came to a place of understanding that um, I had an addiction that I needed to recover from. It was an addiction to love and relationships and trying to find my identity in other people. I struggled with codependency, like putting all of myself on somebody else and, and letting them have to carry the weight of that when they were like, what? I didn't ask for this. Um, and I had worked so hard not to be truly known because I thought the true me would be unacceptable. But through Celebrate Recovery and through God's word, I learned that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so by the time I got to step eight in Celebrate Recovery, I was willing, not comfortably, I think I stared at the carpet the whole time, but I shared my secrets with a trusted mentor, my small group leader, and I was met with more grace than I'd ever known could exist in another person. The shame of that incident that had happened in my teens just with one sentence, she wiped away what I had been living burdened by for most of my life. And what I experienced was freedom that I had never known before. And so through Celebrate Recovery, I also learned kind of beyond step eight, you go through this process of learning about confession, forgiveness, and repentance. And Jesus taught me why hiding my sin was equivalent to hurting myself again. It gave the enemy a foothold. It taught me to believe lies. It didn't do anything for my healing. And it certainly didn't keep it from impacting me. And so opening up and being honest and trusting God and trusting other women with my truth, um, he taught me that that was going to be part of my path to healing. This is getting much longer than I expected, but um, pretty early in my recovery journey, I had one of those experiences with Jesus that I would have trouble believing if you told me it happened to you. But I'm going to share it with you because I think it's really powerful. So I was attending this conference called Intimate Issues, which I had a lot of intimate issues. <laughs> I was still single, um, but I had what I would call an encounter with Jesus over the sexual sins of my past. And the women who were leading that event, they read the story of Luke 7, but they shared it in a way that I'd never heard it before. It was more um, more narrative than maybe um, what is in the scriptures. So they kind of took some liberties with this story, but this is the story about the woman who um, comes to Jesus's feet while he's reclining at a table. And um, she's called the, I think, an immoral woman in the, um, in the scripture. And they talked about how this woman, um, you know, we didn't, it didn't really explicitly say 
much about her, but the assumption is that she had um, was possibly a prostitute or um, had at least given her body away to men that were not her husband. And that um, you might imagine in this day and age that people who knew this about her, like mothers would cross the street with their small children and be like, oh, we can't walk on the side of the street with that immoral woman. Um, but she knew that Jesus was in town and she went to him um, in this home and she reclined at his feet and she wept buckets of tears, I would imagine. And she wiped his feet with her hair and she was forgiven for her sins. And she brought this, um, I don't know if this, if it's called perfume in this part of the scripture, but she had brought this flask and she poured it on him. And the way they told the story was that, um, this may have been what she'd poured on herself before, an encounter, you know, with a new man. Um, but she dumped it all. Like she gave it all to Jesus and, um, you know, came to him in incredible regret and confession and, and seeking to receive forgiveness from him. And he of course gives that to her. And so they're telling this story and they say, you know, before we can go on to talk about any of the other issues, any of the other topics of this conference, if you have work to do with the Lord about your past, like this woman, woman did, we urge you to take care of that now. And so with tears streaming down my face, I was sitting in the middle of a large section of seats, like auditorium style seats. And I do not remember how this happened, but I leapt from my seat for across nearly half a dozen women. And that's the part where I'm like, I think he lifted me and carried me. I'm not so sure. <laughs> but I fell to my knees in a dark corner of the room. And I asked forgiveness for every man that I had been intimate with. And I asked for healing. And as they described, you know, imagine being at Jesus's feet like this woman was in Luke 7. I could see the nail holes in his feet. I could envision that in my head. And I knew that I was kneeling at his feet before him. And I felt in that moment, really for the first time, whole and free, totally from my past. And there had been a woman that at some point, maybe halfway through this, I don't know how long I was kneeling on the floor bawling hysterically, but a woman came up and put her hand upon me and began to pray for me. And afterwards, I connected with her and she said, I was praying for you. And in the moment, I felt the spirit change my prayer because I was praying for you know, all the hurt and everything that you must have been feeling. And in the moment, I felt the Spirit say to me that he was going to use your story for good. And that I was, you know, this was still like, oh, I never would share my story publicly. I, that everything that I shared with like one or two people, with that was going to go to their grave. Um, but in the years that followed, I did. I began to share my story publicly and women came out of the woodwork to say that me sharing my truth helped lead them to freedom as well. There was a verse um, that the Lord used in my life in that season, Psalm 41 and 2, which says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground, and he steadied me as I walked along. But I had never read what comes after that. I don't know why I stopped there, but I just kind of felt like I'm in the mud and the mire. <laughs> um, and Jesus is lifting me out. Um, so the next verse, I believe this is verse three. It says, he has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be astounded and they will put their trust in the Lord. And that was me. 
I turned away from a life of sexual immorality into a life of sexual purity. I was still single at the time. I wasn't dating. I mean, there were zero prospects for like eight years. (laughs) Um, And I waited for years for the Lord to bring me a husband to the point that I kind of told him at one point that I was just not waiting anymore, that um, maybe this just was not his plan for me. Um, But eventually, when I was 39 years old, a guy that I had been friends with for years, never was interested in, never considered dating, never shopped him. Um, And he wasn't interested in me until now, he says, God flipped a switch in him. It was like an overnight thing. And he was a kind and loyal man. And I thought he was a little bit dorky, but my friends were like, oh, no, he's a good guy. And I'd never dated a man for his character. Never occurred to me. Um, And at one point, he said, like, my character is really all I have to offer you. Um, And that was confusing to me. I was confused all about his pursuit of me. But in that confusion and in my um, willingness to be honest with him about all of that and him with me, we had some of the most honest conversations I'd ever had with a man. Um, I certainly was not the easiest (laughs) to pursue for him, um, but he was the first man that I'd ever known to put the idea of relationship totally in God's hands and to not be seeking anything for himself. Obviously, this was new to me too. I was always seeking something for myself. And so there was this shift happening in my life. And um, Todd, my husband, (laughs) um, his kindness in the middle of my mess, um, I said yes to a first date in December of 2007. And this November, we will celebrate being married for 10 years. We have wrestled through paying a huge sum of debt in the first years of our marriage. We have wrestled through miscarriage and infertility, adoption, and parenting to small humans. (laughs) Um, And I am now 18 years into my walk with Jesus, and I have learned that without him, I am incapable of change, that it is through his power and my submission to his will that my character And my behavior and my past can be redeemed and changed. I tried for so many years on my own to change or cover up or hide. And none of it, none of it provided the freedom that I found in Christ. I have witnessed God's faithfulness. And I have learned that he can change my heart and my mind so much that I hardly recognize myself today. And I've also learned that he doesn't waste my struggles. Instead, He uses them to grow me spiritually and draw me closer to him. And that is one of the things that has fueled what I want to do with Devoted Dreamers, the podcast, and anything else um, that's been percolating in my mind about what I might do with this brand. So there's a a one last verse that I want to share with you. Psalm 27, 13 through 14. It says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So if you are struggling, if you have never shared about your past, if you've never exposed your past to the light, I want you to know that he is a redeemer, that he is good, um, and that he can be trusted, and that your story, whatever it is, is not too much for him. So um, thank you for listening to this episode twice as long as I expected to share today, but hopefully you could listen to it um, on 2x or or 1.4 or something. Um, But thanks so much again for being here. Thanks for being a listener of the podcast. Um, If you're not actually a listener and you just kind of came here to hear my testimony, I would encourage you to go back and listen to some of the solo episodes from 2019 and the early part of this year. Um, This is just kind of the journey that God has me on for thinking through how we are to um, live and walk with him and pursue the, um, I call them God-shaped dreams that he's put on our heart. If there's anything that I can do to encourage you, to point you to Jesus, to remind you of who you are in him, because knowing that is really the first step toward hope and healing is to know that you are a daughter of the King and you are chosen and beloved and sung over. Zephaniah 317, go look that up. Um, He cherishes you as his daughter. 
And I deeply long for you to know that. So I am now off for a season break during the month of June. So you probably won't hear from me for several weeks, but please um, check out my Instagram. I'm at Merit J-O, that's M-E-R-R-I-T-T-J-O. Or come over and join the Devoted Dreamers Insiders group on Facebook, either of those places. Um, I'm going to be sharing every day in the month of June the top 30 episodes of the last three years of the podcast. So if you're new or if you're old, (laughs) if you've been here for a while, you're probably going to encounter one or more episodes that you haven't yet heard. So that's what you're going to get, even though I'm on a little bit of a break for the next 30 days. So thanks so much for being here. I'm so grateful for you and I will catch you in July. 